You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Sarah Paretsky on the show with me. Uh, we're here to talk about the 21st book in the V.I. Warshawski series. Uh, Overboard is the new book, and it sure is great to have a new book with Vic out in the world. Uh, I, I know that your fan base for this series uh, Sarah is is huge and uh, and ravenous and you know all of the all of the great words to describe people that just can't wait to get their hands on a new book with Vic and crew and you have done it once again. Uh, Overboard is a phenomenal book and uh, it's got some really really interesting subject matter that we're going to talk all about today. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thanks so much, Hank. I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you. Um, I, I've been thinking um, of some uh, some things to ask authors to to kind of get some conversation started. And there's a an interesting question that I've been looking at lately. Um, what is a piece of writing advice that you have gotten over the 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 path of your career? Maybe it was a piece of just great advice that you've held on to. Or maybe it was just tragically terrible, and <laughs> you know, and and it's laughable at this uh, at this point. Or maybe you have a piece of each. But is there a piece of writing advice that that you've gotten along your journey that has stuck with you, good or bad? Well, both really. Uh, when I first started this, what became this series, I I wasn't imagining that there would be all these books about the Warshawski. When I started, I was had this goal of trying to prove that I actually could write a novel. I, like many writers I've been writing since I was since I was first literate, you know, six, yeah. seven years old, but very privately, just stories and little poems. And I just didn't know if I could do it. And I was struggling with what became indemnity only when uh, Stuart Kaminsky of Blessed Memory, who taught at Northwestern University just outside Chicago, he was a published crime writer as well as an expert on film, and he offered a night class on writing detective fiction. I signed up for it. I showed him the 60 pages that it had taken me almost a year to write, and he he just gave me such good advice. Uh, some of it was about language. I was using language from the 1930s. It was anachronistic. It didn't work. Uh, and and he kind of spelled that out. It's one of the things that I pay attention to now. Slang is very ephemeral, and you you use you have your characters speaking in today's slang, especially today with the internet, with language changes like that. Right. Your book is going to be dated before it's in print. So that was helpful. And then the other thing that he felt was because at the time I was working in the insurance industry and he said, you know, there's not a lot being done with white collar crime. Have your detective specialize in that. And that was a big help too. Then my husband who, um, whom I lost three years ago and it still, still is a hard loss, but he was my first reader always. And he kept saying too many adverbs, too many adverbs. And I was like, Courtney, you're a <laughs> physicist. What do you know? And then finally, he was reading it out loud to me and I thought, Oh my God, he's absolutely right. Too many adverbs. That's, that's hilarious. And, and, and your response was there's precisely exactly the right amount of adverbs. But. <laughs> As I began Xing them out and I mean, really what he, he wasn't a, a literary critic or he knew he had a, uh, sense of what was wrong, but he couldn't articulate it. And as soon as I saw he was right about the adverbs, what he was really trying to say was, you're telling, you're not showing. Right. And, and that is, is 
I mean, they tell us that all the time in writing 101, show, don't tell, show, don't tell. But until you're really confronted with your own work and you see that you're describing things in this dull adverbial way instead right. of bringing the reader right there into the action, that's what you have to see. That's that's great advice. Um, it, back to your your first piece of advice, you did the uh, or uh, the second thing you mentioned about the slang. Um, I, I hadn't really intended to to go here, but since you brought it up, I think this is a a great place to talk about that because your books, the um, uh, the the Warshawski books, are uh, are rooted in Chicago, in a in a very particular specific place. Um, and and you yourself uh, hail from there, and there are very Chicago things that go on uh, in in the books. Uh, how do you kind of anchor the books in this particular place, in this in this particular setting, without allowing yourself to use anachronistic? things that are going to be dated uh that that's such a hard thing because there are certain things that are very chicago and very of the moment um but you also want people to pick up this book 20 years later and it be just as impactful then H how do you i i guess the to to sum it up how do you give the flavor of a place without dating it I'm not sure that I really have threaded that needle, Hank. It's a great question. And sometimes when I go back and read the earlier books, which I try not to, because once they're in print, <laughs> you can't fix all the things you see right. five years after they're in print. But a city is such a rapidly changing landscape. And you're describing buildings that may come down or or parks. We have a park in my neighborhood that is supposedly on the National Historic Register and shouldn't be tampered with, but the city's about to dig it up and turn it into a golf course. So um, kind of my fury over the city digging this up to turn it into a golf course overrides all my literary <laughs> <laughs> considerations. And I actually used that as the plot for my most recent previous book, Deadland, was all based around the, the city of Chicago's efforts to privatize its parks and make them inaccessible to ordinary people. So, um, oh dear, someone just gave me a, a review of Overboard and said, Paretsky leans to the left. And I thought, well, that's an insult. I don't lean to the left. I've fallen all the way over onto the left. <laughs> um, but no, really, I'm more about justice and voices of ordinary people and and if if it's left leaning to say you don't want a billionaire running your life, then I uh, I plead guilty. But it does make it hard to not to use landmarks or situations that will be missing even in another year or two years. Yeah. In Chicago, maybe every city is like this or a small town. I don't know. But our previous several mayors ago, Richard Daly, the famous Daly family. There used to be a little airport landing port along the lakefront, Meg's Field, it was called, that uh, was for corporate jets primarily. I mean, small people who had small planes flew in and out of there. And for some reason, Mayor Daly didn't want that airport. And um, suddenly, and this was during right after 9-11, a couple of years after 9-11, when we were still having red alerts and no-fly zones and so on. And yeah. uh, the country was on red alert. And Daly asked uh, then-President Bush for um, to put Chicago in the no-fly zone. And he wouldn't. Uh, and so Daly called all of his um, staff in at midnight. And he, he said, he'll protect Disney World, but he won't protect um, Chicago. And so he ordered the city bulldozers out in the middle of the night and dug up Meg's field. And I thought, well, you know, that is actually a federal offense, but uh, Bush <laughs> let it lay. And I thought, God, we're lucky he didn't decide to dig up O'Hare because Chicago mayors have an incredible amount of local power. <laughs> they probably would have done it for him. Wow. That Yeah, there, there are 
like you said, it's such a precarious balance to uh, to get the the particulars of a place, the flavor of a place without um, without dating it. And some things are just out of our control. And sometimes you just have to go for it and just hope that things are lasting because they they may or may not be. Right. Yeah. Um, the uh, Overboard is the the 21st novel in this series um at from this vantage point um you know that there are certain uh benefits to writing a long running series your your world building uh to to kind of pull a term that's more familiar maybe to science fiction and fantasy but but world building is is a real thing in in all genres there there are certain aspects that when a reader picks up the new uh, book with Vic and crew in it, you, you know what to expect. You know the landscape. You know uh, at least a portion of the cast of characters, and you, you know that there's not a. You don't have to completely set the scene all over again with each book. Um, but also with a long running series, th- there are certain things that are more difficult about it. Um, there, uh, you know, how do you keep uh, the the tension? up with a a character that we know is going to return book after book? Yes, Hank, that's such a good question. And I think with Overboard, I struggled with that a lot. The finished book, I I do a lot of rewriting. I do a lot of discarding. I'm not a good uh, chess player, so I can't do like people like Elizabeth George or the late great P.D. James who are meticulous outliners. I can't think that far ahead. I put my characters in motion and I see that the action that I was planning isn't working for for these characters or to tell the story I need to tell. But with Overboard, I kept changing the narrative and the finished book is my seventh different attempt at it. It was reassuring to me to start hearing from other writers that the pandemic affected them in simpler ways, that um, that they were having trouble focusing and and keeping keeping their narrative arc in line. And I, I think that was it. It was the uncertainty, the fear, the lockdown, all those things made it really hard to write. Ooh, I strayed away from your question, though. No, that's OK. Um but it was it was harder with overboard than than I've experienced for a long time. And one of the things too is is that as the world to me feels more uncertain, higher levels of violence, higher levels of uncertainty coming out of things like war in Ukraine, the ongoing pandemic, the political instability here at home, uh, I don't I don't want my characters to face the kind of danger that is actually out in the world. I was thinking about that this morning. I'm reading right now, there's a, a LA writer named Gary Phillips, who I think is is a really fine writer. Um, he's been a favorite of mine for a long time. And finally, he has a new book out that's getting the kind of, of response that he's always deserved. And it's it's late coming, but it's it's good to see it coming. Anyway, One Shot Harry, the book is called but I put it down because I thought, oh, no, something bad is about to happen to Harry, and I don't think I can take it. <laughs> Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score. Bearded bad boy Barber Knox refers to live his life the way he takes his coffee, alone, unless you count his basset hound Waylon. Knox doesn't tolerate drama even when it comes in the form of a stranded runaway bride. Naomi wasn't just running away from her wedding. She was riding to the rescue of her estranged twin to knock him out Virginia, a rough around the edges town where disputes are settled the old fashioned way with fist and beer, usually in that order. Too bad for Naomi, her evil twin hasn't changed at all. After helping herself to Naomi's car and cash, Tina leaves her with something unexpected. The niece Naomi didn't know she had. Now she's stuck in town with no car, no job, no plan, and no home with an 11-year-old going on 30 to take care of. There's a reason Knox doesn't do complications or high-maintenance women, especially not the romantic ones. But since Naomi's life imploded right in front of him, the least he can do is help her out of her jam. 
and just as soon as she stops getting into new trouble, he can leave her alone and get back to his peaceful, solitary life. At least that's the plan until the trouble turns to real danger. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score. An Innocent Client, the first book in the Joe Dillard legal thriller series. A preacher is found brutally murdered in a Tennessee motel room. A beautiful, mysterious young girl is accused. In this best-selling debut, criminal defense lawyer Joe Dillard has become jaded over the years as he's tried to balance his career against his conscience. Savvy but cynical, Dillard wants to quit doing criminal defense, but he can't resist the chance to represent someone who might actually be innocent. His drug-addicted sister has just been released from prison, and his mother is succumbing to Alzheimer's. But Dillard's commitment to the case never wavers despite the personal troubles and professional demands that threaten to destroy him. Chosen by BookBub readers as one of the top 100 crime novels of all time, get started on this great series with an innocent client where it all started. Read for free with Kindle Unlimited or buy it in paperback or audiobook. An Innocent Client by Scott Pratt. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic um, because uh, the overboard addresses it directly. And, um, we, and but that that's not the question I want to ask you right now. Um, as a as a writer, um, most writers spend the majority of their time locked away by themselves in an office working with imaginary characters. So you wouldn't on the surface, it wouldn't seem like, uh, you know, a, a global pandemic would would affect writers that much because we don't go anywhere anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, so who cares if you're locked down at home? But there, there's a, there's something that happens. There's a mental thing that has happened when you know everyone else is locked down with you. And, um, you know, there, there are some, you know, mental gymnastics that, that start going on. What, what was your experience, uh, with this pandemic? You, you personally, um, how did you feel that it was changing, uh, your creative life or, uh, you know, how you settled down to do the work? Well, I live alone now since my husband died and that, that's just hard. Uh, I, I think some of the things that make it hard in an ongoing way is that stuff comes up that you just little stuff, ordinary stuff, and you don't know if you're reacting sensibly or not or what you should do next. And you don't have anyone to talk over what's happening in the moment. And I'm someone who's uh, wired pretty high and it's a help to me have someone talk me off the ledge two or three times a day. So I'm I'm missing that in general. And it became more acute, I would say, during the pandemic. There were fewer resources. You couldn't see your friends. Or if you did, I mean, my God, in Chicago, six degrees outside. And um, a group of us on my street, we would get go out, started at, uh, the Memorial Day weekend of 2020, we went out at seven every night and sang. We didn't sing to get, we sang together, but we sang appropriately spaced apart. And we just kept that up for the whole first year of the pandemic, not every night, but three or four times a week. And even, you know, six degrees out in January, there we were bundled up quickly singing, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was such a, uh, support to the spirit but then we'd all turn around and go back inside some people had serious family issues they were dealing with so not being alone was a handicap and some of us were alone and that was a handicap and I think it created greater empathy in a way because you had to be aware of what everyone was suffering but it also created these challenges of not having someone to talk it through with at the end of the day. Yeah. A, a lot of authors um, with their books uh, that were written during the pandemic or, you know, have come, uh, you know, toward the, the end of this two year period that we've been in um, have chosen to pretend 
that it didn't exist, you know, in their fiction. Um, you know, we all live through it. Let's let's don't you know rehash it in our stories. You chose to to represent it in in all of its um reality and in, in overboard. Uh we we've got a, a city that is you know, coming out of its pandemic lockdown, and and that's kind of the setting for for where things are happening. Uh, what were some of the the choices that that you made to to include the reality of what we've been going through in your new book? Because I do write slowly, and it often takes me the better part of two years to write a book. I always have to be mindful of whether something is going to be still be around by the time I finish the draft or whether it's going to disappear. So I kept weighing that as I kept working and reworking the storyline. I thought when the vaccine was announced, I thought, oh boy, we are done now. And so I was going to change the book and remove not the references to the fact that we'd been in this pandemic, but you know, it's going to take away the masks and whether people were worried about transmittal. And then and then we had all the vaccine politics and then the vaccine proved not to be as effective as we wanted against the variants. And so it was clear that that COVID was here to stay. And so it seemed appropriate to not just to keep it here, but to show the way that it was affecting different people's lives. And so you have some people who are really aggressive anti-maskers who go out of their way, like one of the police. I have two kinds of cops in Overboard. I have uh, a police lieutenant named Terry Finchley and his sergeant, who's a recurring character, Sergeant Pizzello. And they are the kind of cops we all hope that all cops are. You know, they're part of the cop culture and they stand together, but they are definitely about law and justice, not about power and intimidation. And then uh, Chicago has a very uh, well-documented and terrifying history of of police abuse of, of individual rights, and especially in the African-American community. And there's a particular... Um, uh, you can't really call it a station. It's more like an administrative center on the city's near west side where uh, suspects are taken and not and their their whereabouts are not recorded. And there's evidence that once they're in that facility, home and square, that torture does occur. So I also have a, a police officer who is part of that um, that group of cops who are who are abusing people in custody and he and vi go head to head and he's part of this very macho culture where he uses part of what he uses to intimidate is the fact that he won't wear a mask and he will spit on you and just kind of make you feel super helpless so i wouldn't say that this book was as much about the pandemic it's not like a medical textbook but it is the way in which people's reaction to the pandemic heightens or you can use their reaction to to underscore what their personality is. Does um, that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Sarah, you, you mentioned earlier that um, uh, you are uh, not the kind of writer who lays out a, a complex uh, plot and roadmap from the beginning and then follows that that outline or roadmap as you write. Uh, yet your books uh, have very complex plots and, and you're uh, you are taking us on a journey of uh, misdirection and where things are revealed constantly through the book and the, the story grows and grows and grows. Um, how do you manage uh, the the way that that your stories unfold and uh, all of the clues that are added um, when uh, you, with your writing process. Well, I I can't, as I said, I, I'm not a chess player thinking 10 moves ahead. But what I do do is pause every three or four chapters and outline what I've done so far so that I can see what the different pieces are. And I like, I like to work with big artists 
sketch pads, the, um, I guess they're 11 by 17, something like that, where I can um, make columns across the, the page and then I can, if you know, you could do it with an Excel spreadsheet, but that just feels so remote to me. I like to see my handwriting on the page and then I feel connected to what I'm doing. So I, I lay out what the, who the characters are and what their interactions have been. And then I can see, like the book that I'm working on right now, the working title is Lands. And I, um, I had written 100 pages and then I thought, whoa, I've got something that's taking me way far away from my storyline. So I backed away from that, but I've outlined it now and I can see what pieces of it I can use and where it's actually going to take me in some exciting directions that I hadn't thought of when I first started writing. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned earlier that it takes you about two years to uh, uh, to write a uh, a book with the the publishing industry the way it is now, where we love to publish a a series book once a year. Uh, does uh, have you ever gotten any pressure from your publisher to uh, to to put out books more quickly, or has has that ever been a factor? Yes, indeed. I am so happy to be published right now by William Morrow. They are incredibly supportive, both of what I write and of my process. But I came to Morrow from Putnam, and there they wanted me to up my production, not to one book a year, but to two books a year. And the, the head of the house actually oh, wow. in Chicago, which they never do, because um, uh, Chicago is so far away from New York. They can't even <laughs> imagine how far away it is. But um, uh, the head of the house came out to try to talk me into doing two books a year. And I, I really thought I was just going to lie down on the sidewalk and hold my breath till my face turned blue. But, um, <laughs> but we were both alive at the end of the day. And, you know, if I could write that fast, I would actually I write very fast. What I'm slow at is thinking. If I was a faster thinker, I could write three books a year. <laughs> Oh, so so speaking of that, um, the the thinking is is the most important part of the writing process. You know, uh, sitting down at the keyboard and and pounding out words is is, is the the end result. Um, are, are there things that you use to help you to get into the mind space of the story? Uh, there are things that I use. I'm always I'm always so anxious, hyper before I start work for the day that I have to go through a lot of different little rituals just to get myself calmed down enough to be in the chair. And I worked for many years in, in the corporate world and in management and uh, in the insurance industry. And um, it, it wasn't a great company in terms of, I don't know, the job wasn't very interesting. I liked my coworkers, but they did incredibly good employee training. They trained me to be a public speaker. They trained us in how to manage unmanageable employees, but they also trained us in keeping our minds on our project. And and um, uh, and they, they had a saying that um, the mind will only function if the butt is in the chair. Um, <laughs> so I, I try to be mindful of that, but I also, I like V.I. Warshawski, like Vic, I sing for fun, I take voice lessons, and sometimes just doing vocal exercises. You cannot be thinking of anything else except your breath and the sound, and sometimes that'll just calm me down enough that I can get in the chair and start working. Mm -hmm. with, with a character like Vi that you've written for so long, um, she obviously is uh, is a fictional character, uh, but she's been with you and a part of your life for so long. Um, do you do you ever think of her as a real person? Do I ever think of her as a real person? Not in the way I know some writers I've read review interviews with people like the late wonderful Sue Grafton would talk about talking with with Kenzie and what Kenzie would tell her to do <laughs> or not to do. Vi, I, I don't have that kind of relationship with Vi. I would say she's more like 
the imaginary friend that lonely children sometimes have. But her voice is also, uh, I've stepped away from her for two novels, two full-length novels that were totally not uh, anything about the world that VI inhabits. And a number of the short stories in my recent collection, Love and Other Crimes, are in a different voice. When I come back to VI after I've been away from her, it takes a while for that voice to, for me to get the right tone for her. Because when I'm not writing about her, when I'm writing in the third person, uh, the mind shifts away. It's further back from the characters in the third person. In the first person, you're right there in the character. Right. Well, for me, anyway. I don't know how it is for other writers. Yeah. Um, are are there ever challenges when when you're starting a new book you know this is this is book 22 in the in 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 her series are there ever new challenges or are there obviously there are challenges are there ever any roadblocks to finding a new story a new plot that's going to fit her there often are roadblocks but um and that was one of the problems that i had with with overboard was getting the story in the right place for for it to be a single a sole sole proprietor detective you know vi is an anachronism in today's world because detective agencies are are huge now they are doing an international security and they're spying on people and they're you know there's no end to what detective in uh, private investigative services are doing and VI working alone without all the paraphernalia and without the backup teams that, that actual investigative services have, she's at a handicap and I have to think of things that she can do to keep herself safe, to look after her clients and to keep it realistic in, in this world of technology, drones, machine guns, and so on. With Overboard, the story that I started with was something that I, I, in the end, could only use bits of. Uh, It was a story that I learned from someone whose son was a lawyer with the Department of Justice, a prosecutor handling cases in which hospitals were using the opioid crisis to line their own pockets. Uh, If you can believe this, hospital executives were actually... Uh, letting we actually giving addicts lifetime prescriptions to their addictive drug in exchange for the titles to their homes or other property. Uh, so the the guy whom I met, his son was prosecuting those particular villains, and I thought, oh, what a great story! But I just couldn't bring it down to a level where an individual, a soul operator could actually handle it so i in the end i used pieces of it turned it into looking at for-profit nursing homes instead of a big international or national global hospital chain but that's the kind of challenge that i often am facing when i'm writing well and and those are very real challenges i've uh, met some authors that have chosen to to start setting books like back in the 1980s before the advent of a, a lot of the technology that we take for granted today because there's so many situations that a character might be in and you think well why don't why doesn't he just take his cell phone out of his pocket and right. call for help you know <laughs> well that that those conveniences weren't real in the 1980s so i understand the challenges of 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 looking for ways to uh to get back to letting detectives be detectives and not having the easy solution. So that, that is a very real thing that writers are facing these days. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I had forgotten that, but it is true. You know, when, before the internet, VI could be on the move and that, that gave you action. (laughs) Now, uh, now the challenge is to find action when all the answers in theory are there on the internet. Right. <laughs> and and those are challenges, but when you find a way to to work around those challenges, that's it's that much more satisfying, isn't it? 
It is. And of course, if VI was just sitting there looking at the internet, she wouldn't have had to to survive being jumped in. Oh, sorry, jumping into the Chicago River, which is. I often walk by that river, and it is so disgusting. And I think, God, VI, you are so incredible. You survived this river. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Overboard is the 22nd book in the V.I. Roshosky uh, series, and it is phenomenal. This is a must-have for your uh, to-be-read pile. You can grab it today in hardcover or Kindle edition or audiobook if that's your preferred method of, of listening to stories. Or go visit your local bookstore and let's support local books, uh, especially in this trying time for bookstores. Um Sarah, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? Thank you. I'm at sarahperetsky.com. My email is there. I answer all my emails, not necessarily quickly because I'm a slow writer, as I've mentioned. And I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Excellent. We'll link up all those places to make it easy for folks to find you overboard. Go grab it today. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show with us today. Hank, thank you so much. And thanks for telling me about the Gulf Coast. Better get your <laughs> guest room ready for next February. Absolutely. But right now, stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Jason and Joey took their food trays outside and sat high above the parking lot on the secluded stairwell that had become their lunchtime hangout, picking at their Thanksgiving specials and swapping updates. They were almost finished eating before Jason managed to screw up the courage to say what he needed to. I want to apologize. Joey looked puzzled. What the hell for? Because your coma was my fault. Yours? The horseman beamed me. You didn't. Hey, want to see something cool? Look what I found on my phone. Joey produced the device, hit a few buttons, and swiped his finger. An orange circle hung in a field of black, overexposed, something that had been moving fast when the flash caught it. I was trying to get his picture, right? Like an idiot? Well, I didn't get him, but that is the pumpkin he threw at me. Jason stared at the blurry orange shape for a long time. Cool. Cool? Can you imagine if we actually got a picture of the headless horseman? We'd be famous by now. He pocketed the phone. Hey, do you want the rest of this turkey? It looks like bologna. Tastes like bologna, too. He speared the slice anyway. Look, this is going to sound weird, but... I think I made you a target. What do you mean? I made you a target by... By telling you about my gift. It's some sort of magical rule... If we reveal ourselves to a normal person, whoever we tell becomes a target for ghosts. And usually, they die. And you told me anyway? No, I'd already told you. There was no way to untell you. Don't be mad. It all worked out, right? Right? Joey's expression had darkened. Give me a second here. And there's a bright side. What bright side? Now you'll have a gift, too. Me? That's what your coma was. Some kind of transition. You got targeted, but you survived. You'll be a founder now, like Ichabod. You'll pass your gift to your kids like he passed his to me. Joey looked worried. What kind of gift will I get? People get gifts that complement their natural abilities. It could be anything. Anything? So... I could read minds? I guess. Turn purple and levitate? Probably not. Something that expresses the essential you. Then I'll have an actor's gift. I want... What's an actor's gift? Jason shrugged. Super narcissism? Shut up. So you're not mad? Joey was shaking with excitement. Mad? This is the coolest thing ever! We'll be like the dynamic duo, fighting supernatural foes up and down the eastern seaboard. Jason laughed, feeling epic relief. I thought you'd be pissed. Nah. What's a little coma between friends? He took a bite out of a nutter butter, grinning madly. I'm going to be a superhero. 
but you can't tell anyone. Why not? Weren't you listening? Everyone we tell dies. You can't talk about your gift to anybody. But if they were targeted and lived, we could have our own X-Men. Yeah, or all your friends could die. Do you want to risk that? No, I guess not. But I don't do closets very well, you know? I came out at conception. Promise to keep it to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Joey shifted sideways and walked his sneakers up the brick. So, the essential me. Ooh, I know what gift I'll get. I'll get a singer's gift. What's a singer's gift? Jason shrugged. Superhuman drug tolerance? Shut up! 